Hello, and welcome to Virtual Victorian Days. I'm Sandy Roberts. I'm your steampunk science educator for the weekend, and this is the last program that I have on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Today, we are talking about steam power, and that is the idea of using steam to help move vehicles like trains and automobiles. Um, this was a very popular concept, of course, in the uh, Victorian era. Trains revolutionized the way that things were done. We were able to move lots and lots of items, lots of goods and materials all the way across the country much more quickly than ever before. People could travel on these trains in relative comfort and therefore you could move around much more than they ever could before. So steam power was fundamentally important to how um, our world changed you know, during the Victorian era. Now, the idea of steam powering different devices actually wasn't brand new. It had been around since the 1700s, but James Watson invented a new type of steam engine that was able to work much more efficiently and to power larger items. Um, and by doing that, by the time we got to the Victorian age, that technology had really taken off. Now, I'm wearing my steampunk hat and I love steampunk fiction. Steampunk is based on the idea that steam became the overwhelming energy source, that we never maybe discovered electricity or other things, that we were able to power everything through steam power, um, which is pretty fascinating, especially once you understand how it all works. So we're gonna talk about some science behind steam energy, and I'm gonna come up with a couple different experiments that I want you to try at home so that you can uh, explore these concepts. And then we're gonna do one simple experiment together. Uh, it's really fun and I think you're really gonna enjoy it. So why don't we go ahead and get started on the science and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about the science of steam. Alrighty, so let's start with the most obvious part of this. What is a steam engine? Let's see, there we go. So here we see uh, a model of one of James Watson's uh, early steam engines. And the basic idea is that you use the force produced by steam and steam generates pressure. And it we can transform that pressure into mechanical energy. So a piston, which you can see here is pushed back and forth and it's got a connecting rod that goes to a flywheel. And so it takes that back and forth motion and transforms it into a rotational motion. Now, this probably all sounds kind of complicated, but I'm gonna break it down for you so you can see how it all works, okay? So why don't we start at the very beginning? Cause I don't know, you know, where you are as far as what you know about science. Some of this may be a repeat for you. That's okay, it's always good to remember these things. Okay, we're starting at the very beginning. All matter, anything you can touch and feel is made of atoms and molecules. Those are the tiniest particles, right? Um, and different atoms make different materials. We don't need to get into the chemistry of it today. What I want you to understand is that all these atoms are kind of loosely held together. They kind of pull together like magnets and they're always in motion. So even though you may feel like you're sitting still, all your tiny little atoms are vibrating and moving all the time. So what does this mean? This means that extra energy can make those atoms and molecules move more. So we're all pretty much solids, right? <laughs> that means our atoms are at their stable temperature um, and they're nice and neatly arranged. It's kind of like um, if you set the table, everything's nice and neat, right? But then everybody comes to the table <laughs> and their energy starts moving things around. Well, you add energy, usually in the form of heat, and that solid is gonna melt into a liquid all those little atoms and molecules are getting extra energy and they're spreading out and they're moving around. Think of it like right after Halloween when you eat a bunch of candy and now you have lots of energy and you wanna run around, same kind of thing. So our solids with more energy become liquids and they spread out. And then with even more energy, they become gases. They evaporate and they become gases. And that's the most spread out those particles can be. And if you've ever boiled water, you've seen this where the steam rises and it just floats away. Um, and then again, when things cool down, that gas is gonna condense back into a liquid. It's gonna, those particles are gonna come closer together. Those molecules and atoms are gonna come closer together and gets even colder, loses more heat, loses more energy 
gonna go back into a solid. In the case of ice, it needs to be pretty cold, right? To line all those atoms back up and go back to being a solid. But the idea is that when you add temperature, you can make those atoms and molecules more energetic and make them move around more and make them want to spread out from where they are. They get also what we call less dense, which we're going to explain in just a moment. So this is one of the fundamental things, that state of matter change from liquid to gas is how we get the steam, okay? Now, convection is a really important idea. Here's the way to think of it. When something is warmed and those um, atoms and molecules want to start spreading out, well, they get less dense. What's density? Okay, it's basically how much matter, how much stuff you have in a given space, okay? Here's how I like to think about it. If I gave you a bag, a garbage bag filled with feathers, and I also had a garbage bag filled with bricks, and they're the both the same size bag, and you got to choose which one you want to carry around all day, you're probably gonna pick the feathers because even the same bag amount of feathers the same volume of feathers, it's a lot less dense. It's less heavy. So the feathers have less mass. So less mass in that volume, easier to carry. Bricks, that's a lot of mass in that bag. So that's a very dense material. And it's gonna be a lot harder to carry around all day just because it is so dense. So even though it's the same volume, one has a lot more mass and weight than the other does. So warm gases, warm waters are less dense than cold water or cold air. You may have heard that heat rises and that's exactly what they're talking about is that all that extra energy, okay, from the heat makes the molecules and atoms move around a little bit more and spread out. Okay. So you have less particles in the same volume. I have a little picture here of a tea kettle, and this is how we actually get water to warm up when we want to boil water for tea. The heat is way down on the bottom, right? So the water on the bottom is constantly getting heated and it rises, right? It's less dense. It goes to the top. Well, the water at the top is cooler and it's going to get pushed down. Okay. And pulled down by gravity. This motion of heat rising and, uh, cold falling is called convection and it's super important. Not only is it important to steam engines, it's actually really important to how wind is made, believe it or not, um, how currents in the ocean happen, um, how air currents happen, how we get weather. All of it ties back into this idea of convection that heat rises and cooler fluids fall to the ground. Um, or in this case, in the bottom of the pot. Now, because of that motion, it's kind of like it's always stirring that water and eventually it all reaches the temperature it needs to transform and evaporate into steam. And that's why we want to talk about this because that's the whole point is to get things to evaporate and go into steam. Now, I have my first little experiment for you. You can totally try this at home. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to get an ice cube tray, get some blue food coloring or a little watercolor paint and make ice cubes with the blue water, freeze them overnight. Then get yourself a nice big clear bowl or um, like a plastic container, fish tank, whatever. Fill it with regular room temperature water from the tap, not too hot, not too cold, okay? And then get some really warm water. Ask a parent for help. Let's get some kind of hot water and add some red food dye to that. On one side of your fish tank or your Rubbermaid container or your bowl, you're gonna add a blue ice cube. And on the other side, you're going to very carefully add your hot water. What will happen is, as you can see in my picture, the blue water, the blue ice cube is going to melt, but that water is going to be colder, more dense, and it's going to drop to the bottom of your bowl. Meanwhile, the hot water is just going to spread out on top because it's less dense. And in the middle, your room temperature water is going to make a layer. So you can actually get a layer of cold water, room temperature water and hot water on top. It's really cool. It's really fun to do. It's not hard. It's just a little water and food coloring. And then it's really kind of cool to see how long it takes before these things do all come to the same temperature and mix. And then you get purple water and it's really fun. So that's experiment number one that I want you to try at home. And if you have any questions, you get in touch with me. Okay. All right, moving on. So that's convection and it's really important 
to understand because it's how we get steam and that movement is actually really important to um, how steam engines work. The next thing is pressure. I have a picture of a balloon here because in this case, we're not talking about pressure for a balloon anyway, that's being caused by temperature. Instead, that's where you're actually blowing extra air into the balloon, right? Back to our feather example, what if I were to go and shove more feathers into that uh, that bag and really stretch the bag out because I push as many feathers into that bag as I can? Well, that's basically what you're doing when you fill a balloon with air. When you blow into it, you're pushing extra air in there. Well, that air has nowhere to go. It's trapped in the balloon. So it starts moving around and it's banging on the edge uh, inside of the balloon. And it's kind of like punching, 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 trying to get out. And that's what pushes the balloon out. Okay, so it's all that energy making that happen. Well, same thing happens in a piston, except instead of a rubber balloon or a latex balloon, we're talking about a metal cylinder. That metal cylinder, if you force hot steam into it, it's got nowhere to go. You keep pushing steam in there, it's got nowhere to go. It's gonna bang on the outsides of that cylinder. Now, you have to be careful because you literally can blow stuff up that way, okay? But in the case of a steam engine, we're gonna use that that pressure that's being created by the hot steam and we're going to make that into motion and into mechanical energy but it's the same thing like blowing up a balloon now one cool thing i want you to uh, try out at home too i want you to get a balloon blow it up and put it in the freezer because a lot of steam engine stuff is based on one of the ideal gas laws and these are a, a handful of, like three laws that were figured out in right around the Victorian era that describe how gases work. And in one, it's if you increase the pressure, you're gonna increase the volume. That's how a balloon works. You add more air, you increase the pressure inside the balloon, balloon blows up, gets more volume, gets bigger. But and that's Boyle's law. Charles's law, on the other hand, is about temperature. And what it says is that if you heat up something, if you raise the temperature, the volume will expand. That's the idea behind a steam engine, right? You heat up that water, it becomes steam, that steam expands and causes pressure. But if you reduce the temperature, the opposite happens. The volume gets smaller. So you're gonna take your balloon, you're gonna blow it up and you're gonna put it in the freezer with your parents' permission and wait at least like three hours. Let it get really cold and go get your balloon out. Now here I have a picture of someone pouring liquid nitrogen over it. If you happen to have liquid nitrogen sitting around, you can do this much more quickly. If you have a welder in your family, that might be someone you could ask, but a freezer works fine. What you'll find is that the balloon will actually shrink because all those little air molecules in there, well, they're starting to essentially kind of condense. Okay, they're less energetic and they're less dense. So they're exerting less pressure. They're not banging on the outside of the balloon anymore. They're trying to like, oh, I'm cold. I'm just going to go take a nap. Um, so try this out. This is a great way to explore Charles's law and then take that balloon and let it sit out, uh, out on the counter for a while. See if it gets big again. If you want to, with your parents' permission, you can also measure your balloon if you have a tape measure or just a piece of string and then take that balloon and put it in a bowl of warm water. Not so hot that it will pop the balloon, but good warm water and see if you can make your balloon expand by adding extra heat, okay? Really fun experiment to do at home. So I hope you try that out too. All right, how does all this actually have to do with steam engines? Now you understand the physical science behind it. Let's talk a little bit about the engineering. We have here a picture of a piston. We still use pistons today. That's how we have our combustible engines in our cars today, working on the same principle that the Victorians came up with for their steam engines. So a piston, as I said, is a metal cylinder. It has this piston head, it's gas, gas um, tight. So there's usually like rubber here so that the gas can't leak out around that head. It kind of has to stay there. And then it's attached to a rod. And you can see it, there are two spots. In comes the hot steam from the boiler, okay? That steam comes in here. Well, it's expanding, it's exerting pressure, and it's gonna push this um, head up, okay? Then it's gonna condense. That air is gonna go out, or maybe if you've got a double boiler, you're gonna push steam in from the other end, and it's gonna push this back down. There's a couple ways to do it. You can um, make this side over here cool, and that will condense everything, right? 
or you can simply have two boilers back and forth. But this is gonna create a back and forth motion. Give me one second, I'm gonna show you what that looks like, but I gotta get myself out of the picture first. Okay, and here we go. Okay, so you can see the movement of the head of the piston in the cylinder, and you can see the movement of your boiling liquid. So you're pressing the air out or the steam out and then pushing new steam in. And this gives you this back and forth motion that we think of when we talk about a piston and how it works. You can replicate this, by the way, um, by using a couple of plastic uh, syringes, which you can get. Okay, so <laughs> that's basically how piston works. Now, up and down motion can be certainly very useful, but to make something like a train work, you need to take that back and forth motion or up and down motion and make it into a turning motion. And that's where the next part comes in. You need a crankshaft and a flywheel to make that happen. So here you can see, here's the rod from our piston, okay? And it comes up to another piece that's called the crank or the crankshaft. They used to originally just use that on a wheel, but it can be kind of a jerky motion. So a flywheel that turns it into nice smooth rotation, then attach that to a gear, okay? And then that gear attaches to your wheel. So let's see how this actually works because this was the big mechanical um, key that made things like trains and automobiles possible. And in fact, it's the same thing that we use right now in cars today. So here we go. I'm gonna again, remove myself from the picture. Here we go. And play our little video because you just kind of have to see this moving. Oh, taking a little while. There we go. So you can see the piston is going back and forth and it's pulling that crankshaft. That crankshaft is attached to the wheel and it pulls the wheel in and pushes the wheel out. And that's the flywheel making that nice smooth motion. And then this flywheel would then be attached to a gear or to an axle on the wheel. So you would have a small flywheel that's attached to the axle and then a larger wheel to actually make the train or car or you know whatever work. Um, but that's the basic idea of a crankshaft. All right, so that's the basics of how steam engines work. Here's one thing I do want to tell you. This is not ancient technology, right? Like I said, we still use pistons today. But in addition to steam engines, they also developed steam turbines. You can think of this a little bit like um, a windmill, except many more blades and the steam, the pressure of the steam actually moves those blades around in a rotation. Okay, kind of cool. That can be useful. Here's the thing. We still use that technology today. And you know what we use it for? Making electricity. Can you believe that? We're still using Victorian tech to make our electricity. Here's what happens. Basically, we use the steam. Okay, so we burn coal or we burn gas or whatever. And we make steam. Like we're still making steam. The steam turns a steam turbine. And that actually moves a coil of wire very densely coiled um, piece of, uh, you know, coil of wire, and it moves it within a whole bunch of really big magnets. And when you move wire in a rotation within a magnetic field, that moves electrons and creates electricity. Also something that we discovered during the Victorian era. So, Steam technology is still being used today to generate electricity. And if you wanna learn more about the, the, uh, the combination and the integration and how electricity and magnetism work together and, and how all these things work, I have a class for the library coming up called Physics Quest. Um, and it's starting in about a week and you can sign up for free. And we're gonna learn all about electricity and magnetism. So I think it's pretty cool that steam engines and steam turbines and steam power is still important for us today. We're still using it. And it's the reason I can come to you right now on the internet, thanks to electricity. All right, let's make a couple of cool projects. Okay, 
So, I have a very simple activity for you today. Make sure that you try your ice cube experiment, make sure you try your balloon experiment. But for this one, we're just gonna use simple convection to demonstrate the idea that both heat rises and can create motion. So, all you need is a candle, okay? You need a pen or pencil, marker, whatever you've got, a pair of scissors, and a bit of paper. Now, I'm gonna provide a template on my website for some cool spirals that you can just print out and cut, but Making a spiral actually isn't that hard and it's kind of fun. I like making doodly kind of things. So you can start in your center and you're just going to spiral out. This one's kind of wide. I might redo it. There we go. What do you think? I'm going to try one more time. See, you don't get it right all the, the first time every time. And you can, of course, color this, make it gorgeous, use different colored paper, because when you see this in motion, it's really kind of fun and they look really pretty. You will need a little bit of string, too. Forgot to mention that part. All right, I'm going to try and keep my spiral a little smaller and gradually. There we go. I like that a little bit better. Kind of gradually get larger. I find that it helps a little bit with uh, the motion that we're going to try and create. All right, I'm just gonna bring it in like that. You can think of this as kind of being like a uh, like a snake. It kind of looks like a snake when you cut it all out. Okay, now I'm just gonna use my scissors and I am gonna just trim around my shape and you don't have to be perfect. This is not one of those times that you have to be perfect in what you're doing. Okay. Da -da -da. And around and around we go. This is good if you're working on those scissor skills. Of course, if you want to, you can use um, a craft knife instead. It's perfectly acceptable. And you're just gonna cut your spiral. And you can see I'm not being perfect. But it's also fun once you draw your spiral, if you want to, like I said, get out your markers, get out some glitter, go crazy. You can use beautiful scrapbook paper. Heavy paper works really nicely for this. So if you have construction paper or scrapbook paper or something like that, that works really well. And like I said, I have a couple of fun templates for you, with snakes and things like that, that you can um, print out and cut if you don't feel like drawing your own spiral. I do suggest you try it though. It's a pretty classic shape. One thing I love about spirals in nature is if you're a mathy person, perhaps you've heard of the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is pretty simple. It uh, starts at 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, uh, 5, 8, 13. And basically you add together the previous two numbers. So um, what they have discovered though is that the Fibonacci sequence um, and in fact prime numbers, prime numbers are numbers that um, can only be made by multiplying by one and themselves. So like 13, you can't multiply anything by anything other than one by 13 to get 13. These numbers are actually really important in nature. We find that leaves and pine uh, needles on trees are placed in accordance with these numbers. We find that um, snail shells, which is why I thought of it, um, the spirals inside Nautilus shells actually have their ratios based on prime numbers and the Fibonacci sequence, um, which is pretty wild if you think about it. So these are kind of just numbers that show up again over and over again in our universe and uh, apparently are very important to nature. So anytime I can go ahead and use something like that in my daily life to do cool things, it makes me happy. Okay, here we go, I've got my spiral. Recycle that. I'm gonna grab myself some string. And I think I have a hole punch in. I do. Hole punch in some string. I'm just gonna go ahead and put a little hole here. And you can just poke it with your pencil if that's what you've got handy. But I happen to have a hole punch here, so I'm gonna go and use that. And then you just need a little piece of string. Really it depends on where you want to hang it. I'm not gonna make it super complicated. Dun, 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 dun. And I'm just going to tie it on there. Very simple. Now, the key is going to be, and I'm going to have to switch to the other camera, because we're going to hang this spiral 
above our candle. As the heat rises, it's gonna push on these spirals that we've created, and if all goes well, makes them spin. So let's give it a shot. So I was having some trouble getting my spiral to work um, and getting it all into the camera shot. So I just wanna show you what we did here. I have a tube from some wrapping paper and I've tied my string to that. And I've got my spiral with my flame underneath. You wanna be very careful that you don't get that flame too close to your paper because it can catch on fire. And you can see it is starting to move. the flame underneath. Now again, I am still in a very warm room, so I'm not getting as much of a temperature change as I would like. Okay, since I wasn't getting enough heat in this hot, hot room over a candle, we're gonna try over the stove. Now this is something you only do with a parent's permission. And you can see that immediate movement of hot air has our spiral moving. And you can adjust the heat to get it to move just the way you like. There we go. So there's a lot of experimentation you can do with how your spiral is formed, the weight of the paper, how much heat you use under it, and even, as you can see, I have a shield around it to protect all of that heat. I'm gonna turn it way up just so you can see. And again, this is not something you should do without a parent's help because we are using paper and it is flammable. But you can see that high burner really gets it moving. So I really hope that you enjoyed learning about steam power and how that works. Here you can see my little Sterling engine. This is a model of one of the uh, engines that was developed during Victorian times to make a more efficient steam engine. And it's literally just sitting on top of my cup of tea. And the heat from that cup of tea, remember we talked about convection, is actually making my pistons move, which you can see here on the rod, and then heading up to a flywheel. And that's what you see going on. <laughs> Pretty neat, right? You can find these online or of course you can build your own. Anyway, I thought it would be a fun way to kind of end our session today. I hope that you enjoyed everything that we talked about. Um, if you want more fun stuff like this, go to my website because I do STEM programs all over the area. I do free programs through the library and I would love for you to come to my online programs and eventually when we're back in schools and libraries, uh, come to my in-person programs. But if that isn't up uh, your cup of tea, I do have the book, um, the big book of Maker Camp projects that's with McGraw Hill. It's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can even download it today. And it's got over a hundred projects for you, all on kinds of science and STEM and maker projects and inventing and crafting and all kinds of cool stuff. So there's something for everyone in there if you're looking to keep on exploring and making new things. Thanks so much for coming out to Virtual Victorian Days. This is my last program, so I'm signing off and I'm going to go put my feet up and listen to some great music. I hope that you had a fun weekend. Take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next year.